Testing one.
Yeah. Well, the subcommittee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time, and we may well have to do that. Um, we're expecting a vote series to be called in the next half hour, and I'm told that there are five votes in the series, so if you do the math, maybe 50 minutes or so that we'll break, uh, but we're going to do the best we can because we want to be good stewards of all of your time, so we appreciate you being here. We welcome you to today's hearing on proposed constitutional amendments. Without objection, our colleague Mr. Moran on the full committee will be able to participate in the hearing today. And I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Uh, Sunday, as we all know, was Constitution Day in America. Great celebration, because it was on September 17th of 1787 that our nation's founders signed the Constitution that they had drafted during the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. The Constitution was a new and ambitious experiment in self-governance. It still is that. But it stood the test of time, and we're now 236 years into this experiment. It's the oldest and shortest constitution the world has ever known, and it laid the foundation for our country to be the freest, most powerful, most successful nation in history. It's the envy of the whole world. It's the model for everyone. A key part of the constitution is Article 5, of course, which establishes two mechanisms to amend it. The founders viewed the ability to amend the constitution as one of its most important features, and it has been that. At the convention, El Elbridge Gerry argued that, quote, the novelty and difficulty of the constitutional experiment requires periodical revision. George Mason similarly acknowledged that, quote, amendments will be necessary and it will be better to provide for them in, in an easy, regular, and constitutional way. Of course, we've used Article 5, that process, to amend the Constitution 27 times since 1787, most recently in 1992. Some of these amendments articulate and protect the most cherished rights of Americans. And it's sad for me to say this, but we really do need those protections more than ever today, arguably, because our most fundamental rights have recently come under unprecedented attack. According to a recent federal court decision upheld by the Fifth Circuit here about a week ago, the Biden administration has engineered what the district court called, quote, arguably the most massive attack on free speech in United States history, unquote with its censorship schemes with the big tech platforms online. We have liberal Democrat governors like Newsom and Lujan Grisham and Whitmer who are devising new ways seemingly to trample upon our Bill of Rights. Among other things, the First Amendment, as we know, protects our rights to free speech and association, and it prohibits the establishment of a national church like they had the Church of England, while carefully preserving the vibrant expression of faith in the public square and the free exercise of religion. The Second Amendment secures our right to protect ourselves and our families with firearms. The three amendments adopted near the end of the Civil War moved us closer to fulfilling the promissory note of our Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal and endowed with the same God-given rights, and our national ideal as expressed in the preamble of our Constitution of forming a more perfect union. Many other constitutional amendments have been proposed over the years but never adopted. The provisions of Article 5 create a very difficult process to change the Constitution, and of course that is by design. They didn't want it to be done arbitrarily. The two mechanisms to amend are very straightforward. An amendment may be proposed by a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress and then be ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures, or an amendment may be proposed by two-thirds of the states and a convention called for that purpose. That amendment must then be ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures, or three-fourths of the conventions called in each state for ratification. To date, no such convention has ever been called, but efforts have been underway in recent years to do so. The witnesses before us today will speak about the process for proposing amendments and specific proposed amendments as well. We'll hear about a proposed amendment introduced by Representative Ralph Norman to impose term limits on members of Congress. I'll say parenthetically, many of us here agree with that idea, and I have uh, joined in legislation for years to urge that change. We'll also hear about the balanced budget amendment, which would impose a measure of fiscal discipline that Congress has lacked in recent decades. I certainly agree with that very sensible idea as well. I thank our witnesses for appearing here today, and we look forward to the discussion on these important issues. I will now recognize the ranking member, the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon, for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. And I thank our witnesses for sharing their expertise and views on Article 5 of the Constitution today, I look forward to an interesting conversation about the methods provided by the founders uh, for revision of the Constitution because, of course, in their wisdom, our founders recognized that neither our Constitution nor our Union were perfect at their inception, and it was important to provide for the continual improvement of both. Article 5 provides the means for revising the Constitution but requires extraordinary action by Congress and the states in order to make changes to that foundational document and our national government. 
deliberately placing the process of amending it above the fray of day-to-day -day politics and factionalism. The ordinary and traditional process for amendment under Article 5 requires two-thirds of each House of Congress to pass an amendment and three-fourths of the states to ratify it. And that's what we've done in this country at critical moments in our history. To propose amendments, whether through the initial Bill of Rights, amendments expanding suffrage and civil rights, affirming the federal government's power of taxation, or clarifying the order of presidential succession. Our colleagues across the aisle have called this hearing in order to highlight some amendments which they would like to make to the Constitution, but which have failed to gain traction over the years. I'll discuss them briefly in a moment. But the secondary and more troubling purpose of this hearing is to normalize the idea of a second constitutional convention, which is being actively promoted in some Republican circles. Article 5 also provides for Congress to call a constitutional convention if two-thirds of state legislatures petition Congress for such a convention. Three-fourths of the states would then have to ratify any revisions made by such a convention. Beyond this, neither the Constitution nor history provide much guidance. Although some will argue today that the push for a constitutional convention is a grassroots movement, it's actually an astroturf effort, fueled by dark money in order to promote an extremist agenda. Essentially, being unable to gain the popular support to amend the Constitution in the traditional matter, some right-wing factions are now seeking to convene a convention to remake the Constitution to their liking, opening the door for the erasure of fundamental civil liberties and up to upending, potentially, our constitutional order. At a moment when our national politics are so riven by partisanship that Congress cannot even muster the votes to fund the government, this seems to be a very dangerous idea. Convening a constitutional convention is uncharted territory that raises many questions. How do we count petitions for an Article 5 convention? Who gets to select delegates or determine their qualifications? Will the number of delegates be proportional to the population or, similar to the Electoral College, be based upon the number of states regardless of their populations? Who even gets to decide the answers to these or other procedural questions? It also raises alarms that this right-wing call for a constitutional convention seeks to capitalize on the efforts of the National Republican Party to capture the majority of state legislatures through the red map strategy over the last 15 years. Today, our Republican colleagues seek to highlight two particular changes to the Constitution which they'd like to impose, either through amendment or a constitutional convention, a balanced budget amendment or, and term limits for members of Congress and the Senate. They've been pushing unsuccessfully for those amendments for decades, even when they controlled both houses of Congress. And the reason why they have not succeeded thus far is that while superficially appealing, once one dives into the details, most people decide that these ideas, if implemented, would actually undermine our democracy and tangibly harm Americans' basic well-being. One of the reasons a balanced budget amendment is so unpopular is that it would slash critical social safety net programs that millions of Americans depend upon to support themselves and their families, such as Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, SNAP, unemployment insurance, and veterans benefits. But it's not just those social safety net programs that would be at risk. Federal deposit insurance and military retirement funds would be imperiled under a balanced budget amendment. Anything funded by drawing on savings accumulated in prior years would be prohibited. And of course, it would hamstring the federal government its ability to respond in cases of a national emergency. Balanced budget amendment is essentially a gimmick. We don't need a balanced budget amendment to balance a budget. In fact, Congress has balanced the federal budget as recently as the 90s without any amendment. But it does require Congress to be responsible about both the revenue it collects and the spending it authorizes. When those proposing a balanced budget amendment do so while being unwilling to require wealthy corporations and billionaires to pay their fair share, they make clear that they're only interested in balancing the budget at the expense of middle class and vulnerable Americans. Finally, a quick word about term limits, because I know others will speak to this as well. We do already have term limits. They're called elections. Uh, voters should decide when an elected official's time in office is over, and shame on them if they're not exercising their right to do so. Rather than binding future voters through a constitutional amendment, we should redouble our efforts to promote civic engagement, making it easier, not harder, for eligible voters to participate. I thank our witnesses for being here and look forward to their testimony. I thank the ranking member, and I will... Uh 
call upon the chairman of the full committee, uh, Chairman Jordan, for his opening statement. I thank the chairman uh, for convening this hearing for the good work he and the committee are doing on a number of issues and our witnesses. I, I would just say, it seems to me there are 33 trillion reasons why we need a balanced budget amendment. Um, every state has to balance their budget, every county, every city, every township. Everybody has to balance their budget except the one entity that has the $33 trillion debt. So maybe we should just have a balanced budget amendment of the Constitution and just start tackling this huge, huge problem. And maybe one of the ways to help in that effort is to limit the terms of the politicians who've created the $33 trillion debt. That seems pretty common sense to me. The good folks I get the privilege of representing back in the 4th District of Ohio, my guess is the vast majority of them would say, that's pretty common sense. And so I appreciate the witnesses who are here today, the fact that we're talking about these issues, something that I think needs to happen and should have happened a long time ago. With that, I yield back. Thank the chairman. And without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. We'll now introduce today's witnesses. Mr. Nick Tombalides is the executive director of U.S. Term Limits, a nonprofit organization that advocates for term limits at all levels of government. He's a graduate of the University of Connecticut with a degree in economics. Uh, Dr. David Primo is the Ani and Mark Gabrielian Professor of Political Science and Business Administration at the University of Rochester. He's also a senior affiliate scholar at the Mercatus Center. He's an expert on fiscal policy and the budget process and has authored several books on the topic, including Rules and Restraint, Government Spending, and the Design of Institutions. I haven't read that, but I, I want to. Uh, Mr. Thomas Jipping is a senior legal fellow in the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. His research focuses on the Constitution, the political process, the courts, and other issues. And prior to joining the Heritage Foundation, he served for 15 years on the staff of Senator Orrin Hatch. Mr. Stephen Spaulding is the Vice President for Policy and External Affairs at Common Cause. He previously served as a staff member in Congress, including the House Administration Committee and the Senate Rules Committee, and served as a special counsel to FEC Commissioner Ann Ravel. Uh, we welcome our witnesses and we thank you all for appearing today, especially under these sort of unique circumstances. We'll begin by swearing you in and I'd ask you to rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony that you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. Let the record reflect the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Um, so you, you know that your written statement is entered into the record in its entirety, and so because of that, we ask you to summarize your testimony in five minutes. You all have done this before, but the microphone in front of you has a clock and a series of lights. When the light turns yellow, you should begin to conclude your remarks. When it turns red, your time has expired. Mr. Tambalides, we will begin uh, with you. Oh, sorry, yeah, push that button there for me. All right. All good? Very good. Thank you again. Each year, Gallup does a poll where they ask Americans how much confidence they have in 16 different social institutions. At the very top of the list is small businesses. 70% of Americans have confidence in those. The lowest rated group is the US Congress. Only 8% of people trust Congress. It's also no shock, of course, that 83% of Americans support term limits. That includes huge majorities of Democrats, Republicans, and independent voters. So if 83% of us want term limits, why is it not yet the law of the land? Because the permanent political class thinks that the American people are wrong. They think we're unsophisticated. They think we're not smart enough to decide this issue. I couldn't disagree more. I think the American people can see exactly what is happening here. In the real world, we are surrounded by change, by progress, by evolution. Technology doubles every year. The only thing that never changes and never adapts is Congress. You probably saw the story about the two ancient frozen mummies. Mexico calls them space aliens. Here we call them senators. <laughs> A third of our Senate is 70 or older, including several members who were born before or during World War II. And of course, because of the seniority system, the older you are, the more power you have. In the real world, when a powerful person is showing obvious mental decline, the people around them do what's best for that person. But Washington is not the real world. It's a fantasy world where you get ahead not by speaking the truth, but by groveling to those above you. If you fall in line and vote with leadership, you get to keep your seat for life. We're always told that members of Congress are hard at work protecting our democracy. 
protecting it from presidents, former presidents, the Supreme Court, and so on. One member of this committee even wrote a book about that. But in reality, there is nothing less democratic than a congressional election. Over the last 20 years, House incumbents have a 94% reelection rate. The Senate numbers aren't much better. Last year, 100% of senators were reelected. That doesn't happen because people are thrilled with their Congress members, come on. It happens because the ruling elite have rigged the system in favor of incumbents. I'll give you an example. In just the last few months, I've received this stack of full color male brochures from my member of Congress. I assume everybody in the district got one. On the back in fine print, it says, paid for by the taxpayers. So he spends a million bucks in public funds to tell us that he's against wasteful spending. You help me figure that out. But the bottom line is he is campaigning on the taxpayer's dime. And if someone wanted to challenge him, they'd have to raise money the old fashioned way from real donors. So you can see how the deck is stacked. Where does all the big money go? It flows to incumbents through the power of PACs, lobbyists, and special interests. Incumbents raise roughly 10 times more money than their challengers. That's to say nothing of all the other advantages they hold, like free media, name recognition, and a staff of 20 people who are basically a government-funded campaign team. This very committee has held hearings where politicians have asked, is Mark Zuckerberg too powerful, or is Elon Musk too powerful? I think it's time we started asking, is Congress too powerful? Look what's happening to Google right now. When a private business uses its power to eliminate the competition, it's called a monopoly, it gets fined and maybe even shut down. But when a member of Congress does the same thing, they get reelected. It's a double standard. So the game has been rigged, and as a result, only about 15% of congressional elections are actually competitive. Our most senior members run with phony opposition, similar to how Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping managed to stay in power. Is it any surprise voter apathy is reaching record highs? And people are increasingly saying, I don't feel like my vote matters. I don't have faith in our elections. We need to fix this. A constitutional amendment for term limits is the only way forward. It will create open seats, lower the barriers to entry, and provide us with a citizen legislature as our founders intended. It has to be a six-year limit in the House and a 12-year limit in the Senate, because that is what the American people, your employers, demand. Fortunately, 112 members of the House have already signed a pledge to support this specific term limits amendment and nothing longer. If the bill gets amended to a longer limit, voting for it would be breaking that pledge. I believe this upcoming vote on term limits will be a defining moment for our country. The ball is in your court. You get to decide how history will remember you. Will you be remembered as the rich men north of Richmond, as the punchline to every joke, as the people with an 8% approval rating that nobody can stand? Or will you be remembered as the modern day George Washington? When Washington had the opportunity to become a king, he said no, because he believed in this country and he trusted in its people. He knew there was a time to step aside and let new leaders emerge. For our generation, now is that time. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Chambalides. And um, Professor Primo, you may begin next. Uh, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Scanlon, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the urgent need for a constitutional amendment that restrains the federal budget. My three-part message today is this. First, the federal budget outlook is grim and threatens the economic future of the United States. Second, Congress is constitutionally incapable of tying its own hands, making it difficult for legislators to implement durable changes to the federal budget. Third, a constitutional amendment restraining the budget, if well designed, would provide the foundation for credible and sustainable fiscal policy. Now, my first point is going to take us back in time to 2011. Uh, when I first testified on this subject back then, the nation's fiscal problems were receiving significant attention from Congress, the White House, credit rating agencies, and the American public. Regrettably, the window of opportunity for reform shut before meaningful changes occurred. The result? Federal debt held by the public when I testified in 2011 was $9.7 trillion, about 60% of GDP at the time. Today, uh, that debt held by the public stands at 26.2 trillion and is basically equal to the size of our economy. The debt storm budget experts like I, uh, like me have pre been predicting is here and it's going to intensify. 
The Congressional Budget Office projects that debt levels might reach 181% of GDP in 30 years if Congress fails to act. Unchecked debt growth is gonna have enormous consequences on the economy, interest payments on the debt, and ultimately, it's gonna produce a fiscal crisis. The current fiscal path is unsustainable and threatens the well-being of Americans, especially those in future generations. To get on a stable fiscal path and stay there, Congress needs to act quickly and credibly, so why hasn't it? Well, that takes me to my second point. Congress is its own worst enemy when it comes to fiscal policy. Congressional re-election motivations make it tempting for lawmakers to leave difficult decisions about programs like Medicare for tomorrow. Politically, it seems there's never a good time to deal with the budget crisis. Now, even if the political hurdles facing budget reform are overcome, and that's a big if, Congress faces yet another problem. Specifically, Article I, Section 5 of the U.S. Constitution, which reads, in part, each house may determine the rules of its proceedings. The reality is, Congress cannot write a contract that binds itself to a future course of action. This is true with respect to both substantive reforms, like reforms to Medicare, and process reforms, such as changes to budget rules. What Congress does today, a future Congress can undo tomorrow. And my third and final point, I propose a solution to this quandary, a well-designed amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Such an amendment would place permanent, truly enforceable limits on Congress's ability to tax and spend. And in doing so, it would create an environment under which the question for members would no longer be whether to fix the nation's problems, but how to do so. So what should an amendment look like? In my remaining time, I'll sketch three broad principles for budget rule design. First, the amendment should account for the economic ups and downs that we observe by setting spending limits or targets based on a multi-year period of economic performance, thereby accounting for fluctuations that we'll see naturally over time in the economy. This smoothing approach has been adopted to much success in countries like Germany and Switzerland. Second, the amendment should be flexible enough to account for major disruptions like a war or a pandemic and at the same time should be stringent enough to prevent end runs around its provisions. A large supermajority voting threshold for emergency waivers would go a long way in that regard, ensuring that funding for true emergencies would still be available. For instance, the CARES Act, which passed in the early days of the pandemic, a time of true emergency would have been enacted even if a constitutional amendment were in force at the time. Third, concerns about U.S. Supreme Court involvement in enforcing the amendment should be addressed by limiting remedies and clarifying which parties have standing. The one thing we don't want to do? Reject the entire enterprise of a constitutional budget rule, as some skeptics have done, based on critiques of specific proposals. In closing, the United States is in precarious fiscal health, necessitating the serious step of amending the U.S. Constitution. To be clear, the amendment process is fraught with political and procedural challenges, but a well-designed constitutional amendment will help the country achieve credible and sustainable budget reform. While successes in budgeting have occurred on occasion, these successes have almost always been short-lived. A constitutional amendment can help make future budget agreements durable and reduce political uncertainty. In the absence of a constitutional amendment, I fear it will take a fiscal crisis before Congress acts. Nobody wants that. Thank you again for inviting me to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, for P Professor Primo. Um, Mr. Spalding, I'll ask you to go next. Uh, Y'all are probably aware the buzzer means we have votes. They've started. We have 20 minutes to get there, so we'll squeeze these two in, Is that, if that's okay with everybody, and then we'll race, break, and we'll come back. So, uh, Mr. Spalding, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Scanlon, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Our Constitution has endured for 234 years, not because it is perfect, but because it is a constant work in progress. Despite its famous first three words, we the people, the Constitution long excluded the people who make up the backbone of our nation, including people brought here in chains and counted as three-fifths of a person in the very charter that promised the blessings of liberty. Yet through the hard work of our fellow Americans, our Constitution has expanded freedom, equality, and made our union more perfect, but there is a long way to go. Pursuant to Article 5, the Constitution has been amended 27 times in our history, and each time, Congress has sent proposed amendments to the states after they passed both houses by two-thirds. This process gives certainty and stability to our system. 
The alternative way would require Congress to convene a constitutional convention if two-thirds of the state petition it to do so. There are at least three reasons why convening a constitutional convention is unsound. First, even if it is purportedly called to address a single issue, there are no rules to limit the scope of a convention to protect us from big permanent changes to our constitutional rights that could set our country back. Second, there is an extraordinary risk that secretive wealthy special interests, the same ones that pump millions of dark money into our elections, will use a constitutional convention to further stack the deck and bake their proposals into the Constitution. Third, it puts at grave risk the rights and freedoms that are enshrined in our founding charter. Harvard Law Professor Larry Tribe said such a convention would mean, quote, putting the whole Constitution up for grabs, unquote. The late Justice Antonin Scalia said, quote, he certainly would not want a constitutional convention. Whoa, who knows what would come out of it, unquote. Article 5 provides no rules for how a convention would work. Who sets the rules? Who enforces the rules? Can it be limited to a single subject? How would the delegates be chosen? Will the convention be one person, one vote, sort of like the House, or one state, one vote, sort of like the Senate? Could the convention, or I should say two votes in the Senate, but equal representation of the states in the Senate? Could the convention require a supermajority to propose amendments? And if each state gets one vote, should it still require delegates who represent a majority of the population to support an amendment that gets proposed? The point is there are no settled answers to these questions, and now is not the time to experiment with the Constitution. A convention would undoubtedly attract intense lobbying efforts from special interest groups and powerful people who want to shape the outcome. The influence of unlimited, big special interest money and political pressure on the convention's delegates would lead to amendments that serve narrow interests rather than the common good. An intense lobbying effort is already underway to open the Constitution up. One group, the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, has been particularly active in this effort. And although ALEC is organized as a charity, it is underwritten by major corporations and brings corporate lobbyists and state legislators, legislator, legislators together to write model laws that are then disseminated throughout the country and state houses. ALEC and other big money groups have been working hard to pursue an effort to convene a convention with the goal of writing a balanced budget amendment into the Constitution. If this is added, it would harm the economy force cuts to key programs that protect our health and safety, and destabilize our ability to respond to crises like armed conflict or the next pandemic. Most proponents of a balanced budget amendment assert that 28 states have called for that convention, leaving them six short of the necessary 34 that they need. Considering the times we live in with the government on the brink of a shutdown, Trust in government is at near record lows. And while a constitutional convention is a route that the Constitution authorizes, there are deep disagreements over how a convention would work, who would write the rules, how those rules would be enforced, and how the convention could be manipulated by those special interests I mentioned who have already shown a willingness to stack the deck against the people. And when the stakes are as high as they are, at this moment, too many people would question the legitimacy of whatever came out of that convention, which would invite chaos. We all want things to improve in our country, and the Constitution is not without its imperfections. Its enduring strength lies in its ability to adapt and evolve through a carefully structured amendment process. But at a time of unlimited money in politics and extreme gerrymandering, Using this untested, risky process is the wrong way to make those improvements. The responsible path is to follow that of those who came before us that worked for the 27 amendments added to the Constitution. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Spalding. Mr. Jipping, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Push that button for me, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. President George Washington first published his farewell address to the American people 227 years ago today. September 19, 1796, in the Philadelphia Daily American Advertiser. He explained that the Constitution can be changed only by, quote, an explicit and authentic act of the whole people, unquote. That act, defined as in Article 5 of the Constitution, is ratification by the three-fourths of the states <clears throat> of, an, of a proposed amendment in the manner Congress has, has specified and within a deadline that Congress has set. 
Under Article 5, amendments may be proposed by two-thirds of Congress or by a convention called by Congress upon application of two-thirds of the states. Each of the 33 proposed amendments in American history has come from Congress. The states have ratified 27, four proposed without a ratification deadline are pending before the states, and two, the 1972 uh, Equal Rights Amendment and the 1978 District of Columbia Voting Rights Amendment expired when their deadlines passed with insufficient state support. Congress has three powers in the constitutional amendment process, proposing amendments, setting the mode of ratification, and according to the Supreme Court in Dillon versus Gloss, imposing a ratification deadline. Congress proposes an amendment by passing a joint resolution with two parts, a proposing clause containing procedural rules, such as the mode of ratification and any ratification deadline, and the text of the proposed amendment. Congress has proposed 10 amendments with a ratification deadline, placing it in the joint resolution's proposing clause of five and in the proposed amendment's text for the rest. The validity of a, of a ratification deadline depends on Congress's authority to set one, not on where Congress chooses to put it. The Biden administration's Justice Department agrees. Last year, it defended the archivist of the United States against a lawsuit by Illinois and Nevada trying to force him to certify the 1972 ERA as the 28th Amendment. The Justice Department's brief in Illinois versus Ferriero noted that, quote, members of Congress did not ascribe any substantive difference to the two types of deadlines, unquote, and that substantial historical practice supports Congress's authority to decide where to place a ratification deadline. Turning to the alternative way to propose amendments, in the 1787 convention that produced the Constitution, the framers sought to give the states a way to initiate amendments before, by compromise, they gave that power to Congress. An Article V convention is an interstate convention, what the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel has described as a, quote, servant of the legislatures, end quote, rather than an independent body. Its powers, therefore, are defined by the states expressed through their applications for a convention. In deciding whether it must call an Article V convention, Congress must be guided by the fact that the framers did not want Congress to interfere in the convention process. A February 1993 House Judiciary Committee report reviewed many of the questions that Congress must consider in that light, including whether convention applications that specify a particular subject may be counted with those that do not, whether applications that specify different subjects may be counted together, whether applications must be worded identically or be relatively contemporaneous, and whether states may rescind or withdraw an application before the two-thirds threshold is reached. Current campaigns for an Article V convention appear to be taking steps to minimize conflicts over these issues. The Convention of States, for example, advocates that states pass an identical application limited to proposing amendments that would impose federal or fiscal restraints on the federal government, <clears throat> limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limit the terms of office for its officials and for members of Congress. I have included with my written statement a new legal memorandum published by the Heritage Foundation last Friday that discusses many of the issues that I've touched on today in the context of the 1972 ERA. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Jipping, and all of you. Votes have been called on the floor, so the subcommittee will stand in recess until immediately after votes. Appreciate your patience.
All right, the subcommittee will come to order. We want to thank the witnesses again for your patience. Uh, we will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hunt, for five minutes. We'll let Doug give my time to Mr. Moran from Texas, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Um, when I came to Congress last year or this year, I viewed our out-of-control spending as one of the greatest threats to our economic freedom. Our country's prosperity relies heavily on our ability to grow and innovate, which we can do when we have our fiscal house in order. But we have a bloated national debt of $33 trillion and growing. And it's not the fault of just one party. It's both. Consider these statistics from just the past few administrations. During the Obama administration, we added $8 trillion plus uh, to our national debt, which at the time he took over was just south of $12 trillion. Then under President Trump, another $8 trillion was added to the national debt. And since then, President Biden has added approximately $3.5 trillion to the national debt. And now today we sit at close to $33 trillion in national debt. As a result of our fiscal mess, uh, I introduced the Principles-Based Balanced Budget Amendment, which is House Joint Resolution 80 earlier this year. We've been working closely with Americans for Prosperity on the, the language of this issue. And this constitutional amendment, which is written in a way that is meant to be flexible, comprehensible, meaningful, and frankly, able to be passed and to be ratified, will allow Congress to affirm the principles of maintaining a balanced budget without overriding any of the policymaking power. Core text of the amendment and the primary principle reads simply uh, this way. Expenditures and receipts shall be balanced, which may occur over more than one year. And in fact, the total text of this uh, proposed amendment is just two paragraphs. It also allows for emergency spending with two-thirds approvals from both chambers. But it allows Congress to decide how to balance the budget, whether it's structural or biennial, and gives Congress flexibility to change the design of the implementing legislation. The BBA serves as a foundation for Congress to implement detailed legislation over time that meets the moment. Washington has racked up a pretty hefty bill over the past 20 years, and now families and businesses are experiencing the crippling inflation and soaring interest rates as a result. They balance their budgets. Why cannot we? Increased debt leads to decreased freedom. Regardless of the statutes that would underline this constitutional amendment that would put in place those things that need to happen to make it a reality, uh, we cannot ignore this any further. Mr. Primo, you mentioned in your opening remarks that, quote, Congress is constitutionally incapable of tying its own hands. At present, I agree with you, but I'd like to change that with my proposed constitutional amendment. You testified before this committee in the past in favor of a balanced budget amendment in 2017. Do you think it's needed more now than it was then? And if so, why? I go back and I look at my old testimony, and um, I, you know, I was talking about the concerns I had then about the national debt, and then I look at where we are now, uh, and if I was concerned then, I'm, I'm even more concerned now, and I just don't see a path forward for Congress to, again, act on its own to balance uh, the budget or even come close to balance in the absence of some external constraints. Um, one of the things we always hear is, oh, Congress can balance the budget anytime it wants. Well, empirically, uh, we can look back in history and see that at least in the last few decades, that really doesn't happen anymore. Without a constitutional balanced budget amendment, do you think Congress really will rein in spending the way it needs to and get its house in fiscal order? Unfortunately, just looking at a uh, track record of Congress on lots of other issues, it often will take a crisis before meaningful action occurs. Uh, and some people say, oh, a crisis is a great opportunity for, for action, as the saying goes, but uh, I actually think that's a really terrible time uh, to make legislation and make decisions because uh, you're under the gun. In your opinion, how does the national debt pose a concern long-term for future generations of Amer American taxpayers? And uh, in terms of our, our daily lives, how's it gonna impact us if we do not plot a new course and, and make this change now? Well, as the national debt continues to grow, uh, interest payments obviously are going to, to increase, especially if we continue to see a high interest rate environment. What that means is that uh, a greater share of the uh, government spending will be to paying off, uh, paying interest on the debt, which of course means that less funds can be spent on other things that are important to Americans. Uh, in addition to that, um, eventually, uh, we're gonna start to see an effect of the national debt and economic growth, uh, and of course, Low growth is, is a huge problem for, for societies because it means that we won't have the level of prosperity we could otherwise have as a country. 
many programs such as Medicare and Social Security are uh, captivating a whole lot of our annual spending. Uh, do you think that uh, these important programs should be considered when we are balancing our budget each year? I just don't see a way to not tackle the entire budget if the goal is to have long-term fiscal responsibility. Uh, I think the key, right, is to remember is that the, the, the claim is, well, we, we can't, you never can touch Medicare, you never can touch Social Security, but the math just doesn't work out if you don't consider how you're going to reform those programs. They Dr. need Primo, to be changed. Dr. Primo, I appreciate your time and appreciate your perspective and agree that we need to tie the hands of Congress moving forward, plot a new course, get on a fiscally sane course to balance our budget over the next decade. Thank you for your time. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, a gentleman from New York, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Spaulding, how would a constitutional amendment requiring a balanced budget undermine Social Security spending, military retirement benefits, and other important public service programs? Uh, thank you, Mr. Nadler. Um, there have been a variety of balanced budget amendments that have been considered by Congress, but um, among the many troubling results would be that it would essentially render it unconstitutional to spend uh, reserves and spend reserves to, uh, on Social Security benefits, on military benefits, because the proposals that have been before uh, this Congress have limited um, expenditures to revenues brought in in the same year, and that would require uh, significant and severe changes to Social Security and a whole host of other uh, programs that ensure uh, security, uh, and it's a bad idea. Um, Isn't Social Security premised on the idea of prepaying? Precisely. So when, when you are going to limit expenditures only to revenues that have come in that year, um, the way Social Security is set up, it would require cuts to Social Security. But that's not the only challenge with a balanced budget amendment. What, it, what it's doing is putting uh, fiscal policy into the Constitution. It would put Congress in a straitjacket. It would make it uh, exceedingly difficult to respond to economic crises, to recessions, to armed conflict, to a pandemic, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and, and that is not the way our Constitution is designed. It would also put judges and jurists and attorneys in a strange position where they would be refereeing debates that should be happening here uh, in the Article I branch of government and not over uh, in Article Three, and having jurists kind of weigh fiscal policy. So for a whole host of reasons, the uh, Constitution is not the appropriate place to be debating fiscal policy. Thank you. Mr. Spaulding, do the states or the Congress have the authority to mandate limits on the scope of an Article V convention, such as limiting discussion to a single subject or amendment? No, and that is one of the, that is one of the concerns, um, if not the top concern. There are no rules. The language in Article V about convening a constitutional convention is incredibly spare. It just says Congress convenes a convention. And there's a whole host of questions that I uh, included in my written testimony that I touched on at the oral portion of the testimony, but there are no rules, there are no answers. That's why jurists from uh, across the ideological spectrum have expressed serious concern about how a convention would work. But to answer your question, ultimately, there is no enforceable way to ensure that the convention only considers a single subject. Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. <clears throat> Last month, a far-right group convention of states organized a so-called simulation of an Article V convention. The mock convention resulted in, among other things, the adoption of a limitation on Congress' power to regulate interstate commerce, which would negatively impact numerous areas of public policy, including the continued viability of federal civil rights laws like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and other laws that prohibit discrimination in public accommodations. In your view, would an Article V convention be more likely to threaten or to protect Americans' individual and civil rights? Well, the Convention of States and the organization that has been pushing this amendment and has been uh, getting a number of states to call for this convention uh, is calling for a radical rewrite of the Commerce Clause to do exactly uh, what you are talking about, to uh, significantly and severely uh, undermine civil rights laws laws that protect workers, laws that protect our environment, 
laws that protect our health and safety and security. So I think it is a significant major risk, given that that is one of their top priorities, is a significant rewrite of the Commerce Clause. Would you say that the rewrite or limitation of the Commerce Clause would take us back a long way toward the Articles of Confederation? Uh, I think it would take us way back, who knows how far back, but in, in ways that we have settled this question, um, but it is uh, extremely dangerous. And if you look at the uh, whole host of things that came out of their mock convention, um, that was among uh, their top priority. They also would posit that a simple majority of states could rescind any act of Congress, the president, or a federal agency. Um, and uh, there's a whole host of other you know, provisions that they, that they are pushing for a convention that, again, has no rules. It does sound like the Articles, articles of Confederation, which the founding, which the framers uh, found highly uh, inadequate, uh, which is why you had the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Uh, my time has expired. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I uh, yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California for five minutes. Uh, thank you. M Mr. Jipping, I uh, introduced a, a call for a constitutional convention for a balanced budget when I was in the state assembly um, close to 40 years ago now. Uh, and the arguments against it came from the right, but they were exactly the same arguments we we're hearing from Mr. Spaulding and the Democrats that, uh, uh, well, you have no idea, a runaway convention, there's no way to limit it, it could go out of control. But isn't it true that a, a constitutional convention has no more power to change a punctuation mark on the Constitution than the U.S. Congress has held every single day that it has sat for, for nearly 250 years? In either case, the product, whether it comes from the Congress or a convention, has to be ratified by three quarters of the states. That's a critical point that uh, hasn't been heard here today much, and that is the, the ultimate stopgap of both, uh, pr both methods of proposing amendments is that three fourths of the states have to ratify it. No. But that's that's the ultimate check. But Dr. Dr. Primo, um, I, I share your desire for a balanced budget amendment. But the process you outlined seems to me to be attempting to, to micromanage our affairs into times that we can't foresee. I mean, defining classes of spending and revenue, specifying what constitutes an emergency, multi-year accounting periods, fluctuations in economic performance, a smoothing approach, whatever that means. The beauty of the American Constitution is in its simplicity and its humility. In, in crafting a balanced budget amendment, it seems to me we need to maintain these qualities. We, we shouldn't be attempting to tell future generations specifically how they should manage their, their revenues and expenditures. What is a balanced budget? Uh, isn't it s simply a budget that doesn't require us to borrow? If that's the case, why don't we just say so? That's the essence of the amendment that Thomas Jefferson advocated. Instead of trying to define fiscal years, outlays, expenditures, revenues, emergencies, triggers, sequestrations, and so on, I hope we could just consider 27 simple words. The United States government may not increase its debt except for a specific purpose by legislation adopted by three-fourths of the membership of both houses of Congress. That sort of an amendment would naturally require both a balanced budget and a prudent reserve to accommodate fluctuations in revenues and, and, and routine contingencies. It trusts that three-fourths of the Congress will be able to recognize a genuine emergency when they see it, and that one-fourth of Congress will be strong enough to resist borrowing for, for uh, uh, light or passing reasons. Uh, that is actually my uh, House Resolution 9. Uh, what's your uh, uh, opinion of that approach? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I am sort of my focus is that in fact, or the way I would think about it is my the proposal I have where, where you sort of allow for a smoothing approach is actually it's it's actually placing less of a restraint on Congress to you know to to follow the rules in the Constitution, if you will. In other words, it's saying to Congress that you need to have some flexibility that you may not have perfect balance year in and year out, and it would be impractical to call everything an emergency, right? So if you required a three-quarters vote to have a, to have, to exceed the... Well, if you, if you can't borrow, you're rather forced to, to do that, and that's the whole point of the amendment, is to, to, to force the Congress to live within its means, but not tell it how to do that. I, I would commend that uh, to, to your consideration. Mr. Tumbalides, uh, the, the founders considered uh, term limits for members of Congress. They explicitly <clears> rejected them. 
Uh, I was only one of two sitting members of the California Assembly to endorse uh, legislative term limits in 1990 in California. It's Prop 140. It set a six-year uh, limit on the Assembly at the time. I thought it was going to encourage more goal-oriented members to be much more skeptical of the uh, bureaucracy, much more resistant to the uh, legislative leaders. As karma would have it, I left the assembly in 1992 in the term limits that had no practical effect, and I returned in 1996 when they had had complete effect, and the differences that I saw were absolutely jarring. They achieved the opposite of their intended effect. And instead of arriving in the legislature contemplating their political mortality, members simply arrived contemplating their next political move. They had no experience in state government, so they were far more dependent on the bureaucracy. And since their term was limited, they were far more dependent on the leadership to, and so, since, since it was limited, um, for their next political move. Prior, prior to term limits, members on the committees often had far more experience in the subject matter than the bureaucracies appearing before them. Term limits stripped the legislative branch uh, of this advantage. It shifted enormous influence from the legislative branch to the bureaucracy. Before term limits, there was a sense of loyalty to the institution and the process. Uh, after term limits, there wasn't any. I would just uh, urge you and my conservative colleagues who, who mistakenly believe that term limits is going to improve the legislative branch, please, please look to states like California that succumbed to that siren song and ask yourself if you really want to send the Congress in that direction. I yield back. Um, gentlemen's may, time's may I respond to that? Um, Go ahead. Yeah, we'll let you respond. Yeah, so um, you mentioned the framers of the Constitution. They were actually quite divided about whether we needed term limits for Congress or not. They uh, rejected them. Not all of them. Benjamin Franklin supported no, but the, them. No, the majority of them rejected it for, for, for very good reasons. That, that, among, among them, according to Madison, that, that may be uh, true. That, but that, that someone approaching a term limit would become far more interested in their in their self interest rather than in the nation's interest. That is just human nature. When Thomas Jefferson, let me um, let me let me interrupt because we got to we're going to have votes called again soon, and I don't want to leave anybody hanging. We'll get we'll get back to that. Sure. Um, the uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Vermont for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it seems to me that a lot of the momentum behind the efforts to hold an Article 5 convention is based in extreme frustration with our current uh, system. And I certainly understand that frustration with the, the democratic process and worries that our priorities often are not in the right place. And you know, I would just mention I'm extremely frustrated that we're on the brink of yet another government shutdown because of the demands of a minority uh, faction in Congress. And so. We know that the blow everything up option doesn't work and it often hurts regular Americans the most. And I fear that an Article 5 convention is, is uncharted and in fact dangerous territory. And Mr. Spaulding, can you explain the worst case scenario for an Article 5 convention? The worst case scenario is that it completely puts all of our cherished constitutional rights and civil rights completely up for grabs and special corporate interests, the same corporate interests that are backing this effort right now uh, through the American Legislative Exchange Council and others, uh, would choose the delegates, would write the rules, could even rewrite the ratification rules. We've heard about how it would take 38 states to ratify whatever comes out of this convention. Um, that is not, that, that, the last time there was a constitutional convention, the ratification rules in 1787 were rewritten. Uh, in, in such a way. So that's, that is, for me, not a safe backstop. You don't start a fire and hope that the fire department's gonna come and put it out, that the 38 states are gonna reject them. That could be rewritten. So you have special interest putting our civil rights up for grabs and completely tilting the favor, even, tilting uh, our founding charter even more in their favor in making those changes permanent. And that, that's my concern as well. Uh, the Constitution, as you well know, is, is a bulwark to preserve important rights and liberties, and especially for folks on the margin. If you think about uh, the attacks on the LGBTQ plus community right now across this country, um, would something like same-sex marriage be at risk? Uh, would it continue to be protected under the 14th Amendment? Can we guarantee that if we were to hold a um, convention of the states? A absolutely not. I think all of those cherished rights, uh, marriage equality, the right to marry the person that you love, cl 
climate justice, racial justice, all of these rights and freedoms that we are pursuing and that we hold dear that uh, would all be up for grabs. Uh, those constitutional rights would be uh, at risk of a major rewrite. And the people that are backing yeah, tell me more about that. Uh, the people, folks let's, that, let's, let's just some that lay it are out there. pushing um, some of these amendments mm -hmm. are, are quite hostile to the freedoms uh, that have been expanding throughout our history. Um, and that is one of the goals, is to constrain those uh, freedoms. And if you explore sort of where some of that money is coming from, some of the interests that are backing these proposals, um, it's dangerous. It's why 240 groups uh, have signed a statement opposing an Article 5 convention because it would, as Professor Tribe said, uh, put our put all of our put our Constitution up for grabs. Do you think it's fair to say that an Article 5 convention has the potential to follow unrepresentative processes and could result in some very undemocratic outcomes? A absolutely. Um, Again, the language is so spare. It just says that Congress is going to convene a convention, but it doesn't make clear whether people are going to be equally represented or whether states are going to be equally represented. So is it going to further empower um, states that represent uh, a small minority of this country, um, or is it going to empower people? How are delegates going to be chosen? And again, as I brought up in my opening statement, we're at a time of extreme gerrymandering. There are one group that is pushing this, the uh, Convention of States, it is their view, um, notwithstanding the text of the Constitution, that states would write those rules and that mm -hmm. states would set the rules. It would be one state, one vote, and that state legislators would choose who's going to go to this convention. I don't know where they're getting that from. That is not in the text of the Constitution. But all the more reason that this process would uh, not be nearly as democratic and people-powered as some are positing. I really appreciate that. In the last 30 seconds here, uh, I know a balanced budget amendment is something that sounds great in the abstract, um, but often makes no practical sense for, for a modern nation. Can you just speak briefly about um, your sense of what a balanced budget amendment could do to the economy? Uh, well, it would make it much more difficult to deal with economic crises, mm -hmm. recessions, war, pandemics, uh, and it would harm uh, people in our country that depend um, on a government that is representing them and is meeting their, meeting their needs. And so all of that, again, to put Congress in that kind of a straitjacket and then to tell unelected judges that they're going to interpret and rule on fiscal policy is not the way our system is designed. Thank you very much, Mr. Spalding. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. And uh, the chair, just for a moment, I ask unanimous consent that a statement from Americans for term limits on the history and utility of term limits be inserted in the record. With that objection, so ordered. And the chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing today. Thank you for our witnesses uh, for being here. Uh, when I was in the South Carolina General Assembly, uh, I supported a joint resolution calling for an Article V Convention of States. This was just last year. It passed this re resolution and became the 19th state in the country calling for that Convention of States. Mr. Jimpy, can you briefly describe the steps for amending the Constitution under Article 5? Either, con either Congress or the convention you referred to can propose an amendment by a two-thirds margin. At the end of the day, uh, nothing becomes part of the Constitution that's not ratified by three-fourths of the states. So the, the logic that says um, you should not allow an Article V convention to exist because of the theoretical possibility that it could propose something untoward would say you shouldn't allow Congress to propose any amendments because Congress could propose something that was untoward. The fact is, the Constitution belongs to the American people. They alone, this is why I started my opening statement with uh, President Washington's farewell address, uh, the, the Supreme Court actually held in, in 1795, a year earlier, they actually asked the question, what is a constitution? And they said that the constitution can only be changed by the authority that made it. And so we, we've seen lots of rewriting of the constitution. Uh, people who say that that could happen by a very long and considered process involving a convention, the Supreme Court does it all the time. So we, we have an illegitimate process of changing our Constitution through the Supreme Court. I worked for Senator Orrin Hatch. One of his predecessors as a senator from Utah was on the Supreme Court, George Sutherland. He wrote, there's a difference between amendment 
and inter an amendment in the guise of interpretation. Right, so if you look at this, there's been thousands, thousands of amendments proposed to the Constitution and a handful of them have been adopted. That, that's right, about over 12,000 joint resolutions have been introduced in Congress to propose constitutional amendments. Congress has proposed 33. Right, and so to, to the point, you know, I hear the sky is falling um, from uh, the other gentleman earlier, like that we're going to somehow go backwards uh, in some way, but to me, the only thing that could be proposed and ratified are things that are extremely popular with the American public, like a balanced budget amendment, like term limits. These are the types of things that could rally uh, the people uh, to, to do that. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, the, the, the sky is not falling. Uh, if, I think if, if we had a, you know, a dime for every time that was the argument against a particular position, uh, the, the national debt would be lower than what it is. Uh, I think that um, nothing comes into the Constitution except three-fourths of the states ratify it. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what the scenario is that would get three-fourths of the states to ratify some of the sky is falling uh, proposals that have been suggested here. I agree with you. Uh, Professor Primo, can you talk to me, or uh, how many states currently require a balanced budget? Uh, basically every state uh, requires a balanced budget. Mm. Right, and so every state has to comply with that requirement when they set out the budget. I know in South Carolina we have that. The budget cannot pass until it is certified that it is in balance with tax revenues and what we are appropriating. And so states are doing these things, and states are doing okay, right? So to, to, to borrow that logic, I mean, how would... Uh, how would that benefit the country? You talked about this with Mr. Moran earlier, but how would that benefit the country to have this on the federal level? What it does, it, there's a couple things it does. First, it sets the stage for how budget negotiations will proceed. Uh, it's, it sets a framework for how Congress has to act with regard to, to spending. Uh, you know, one of the things we've heard is that, well, Congress won't be able to respond to emergencies if uh, a balanced budget amendment were to pass. But that's simply not the case. Um, we saw the Congress come together at the beginning of the pandemic and pass the CARES Act uh, with near, nearly unanimously, uh, for, for, uh, basically. Um, so when you have true emergencies, the Congress comes together. Uh, but in situations where you have pieces of legislation that add trillions of dollars to the debt, as we saw a couple of years ago, under conditions that weren't really an emergency, uh, under if we take that term seriously, um, those bills wouldn't have passed um, under the constitutional amendment. It seems to me that's exactly the kind of discipline Congress needs. Yeah, but would it surprise you to know that in South Carolina that the budget is passed every year almost unanimously with both parties agreeing? That would surprise me, I'll be honest. <laughs> so, I mean, section by section you go through, but at the end it is, yeah. it is completely bipartisan. Last question, if a balanced budget amendment were to go into effect, how long do you think it would take to, to truly tackle the national uh, deficit? I think the optimal approach is to have a, a glide path to a balanced budget uh, where you give, this, give Congress at least a decade, maybe even a little more, to really bring the budget into balance because uh, you, know, you can't go from sort of an... Uh, a, 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 a sort of a piggy bank that just seems limitless to all of a sudden saying, now we're gonna have a balanced budget the next year because that would lead to economic dislocation. That would cause many of the same economic harms that uh, the current debt levels uh, have the potential to cause. So glide path to balance and then a smoothing approach once you actually get into balance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman yields back and Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've had an amendment for some years. This year it's House Joint Res 77 that proposes an amendment limiting the pardon power of the president. When introduced it in the previous Congress, some might have thought that it was aimed at Donald Trump. And indeed, his actions did inspire it. But it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. And I introduced it again this year, and so it would be effective with President Biden. One of the things it does is it makes clear the pardon power really hasn't worked as it should uh, for several reasons, but th this particular provision would say the president shall not have the power to grant pardons or reprieves to him or herself, number one, number two, to any member of their family up to the third degree or a spouse thereof, any current or former member of the president's administration, any person who worked on the president's presidential campaign as a paid employee, 
any person or entity for an offense that was motivated by direct and significant personal or pecuniary interest of any of the foregoing persons or any person or entity for an offense that was at the direction or the coordination with the president. So this would affect Mr. Would have affected Mr. Trump, it would affect Mr. Biden now, and who knows who it might affect him after that, but it affects everybody. In my opinion, the president does not have the power now to pardon him or herself, but they shouldn't. The pardon power, that would put one person absolutely above the law. And I don't think they should be able to pardon any member of their family, whether it's their brother, whether it's their son, whether it's their daughter. That should be prohibited. Uh, it's just too inside baseball. Uh, and with pardoning people that are part of your administration or people in your campaign, again, it's almost like pardoning yourself because they're your representatives. Uh, and we saw Trump, of course, pardon Manafort and what's the guy with the hats? Roger Stone and several others uh, taking care of people and trying to Keep them quiet. Mr. Spaulding, what do you think about limiting the pardon power in these ways or any other ways? Uh, would certainly, uh, Mr. Cohen, be uh, interested in reviewing the language um, given the breadth and scope of the pardon power. Uh, no question that we were on the brink. We saw abuse of the pardon power, but for all the, the examples you just, you just gave about close associates of the former president, um, his recent interview just over the weekend, continuing to dangle this concept of a self-pardon merits serious consideration. And I think outside of the constitutional amendment process, there is pending legislation, the Protecting Our Democracy Act, which would also uh, ensure more transparency into the pardon process and would uh, ensure that you have the information that you need as a member of Congress uh, to provide effective oversight and to further understand how the pardon power as being used or abused. Mr. Uh, I think Mr. Flynn was pardoned too, if I remember correctly. Flynn, Stone, Manafort, who are some of the others I might have forgotten? There was. Uh, uh, there, there, were, there were a number. Uh, there were a number. I, can, I won't opine off the top of my head, but as he was out the door, uh, a number of pardons. Anybody uh, else in the for panel major remember donors? any of the people that, that Trump pardoned that were kind of part of his team? Want to offer anything? No? Mr. Is it Tam Baludis? Close enough. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I listened to your testimony and you said some member of Congress, I think you said it was a member of Congress, put out these pamphlets. Right. And you said he spent a million dollars. I'd like to have his MRA. <laughs> Who was that member of Congress that you said spent a million dollars? Well, that was my estimate based on the size of our district and the number of mailers that were sent out, but that was, can... that was my congressman, Bill Posey, who did that. But it's a practice that's all too common here in Congress, and it's a way that incumbents when are able Bill to... When was Bill Posey live. a member of Congress? I'm sorry, sir? When, is Bill Posey a member of Congress now? Yes, correct. He's a member of Congress from Florida. He's a freshman? No. no. Well, he's like DeSantis. He hadn't done anything yet. <laughs> Some of the Florida congressmen, you, you don't know they're on the committee until they run for governor. And then you find out they're on the committee. Uh, a million dollars is much more than anybody could have in their MRA to spend that money. They'd have to have, like, no staff because you pay your staff out of that, your transportation, your travel, et cetera. You're exaggerating. Well, it's a series of mailers that have been sent to my house for years and years and years, sir, so I was referring to the aggregate spending on that. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Mr. Spaulding, what about pardoning members of a president's family, whether it's Hunter Biden or whether it's whoever, the, the, the daughter that had the Chinese uh, uh, patents or copyrights. I think that would be an abuse of the pardon power. Yeah, it should be limited. Uh, I proposed it, and I propose it again, and I think it's, if it's good for one, it's good for the other, and I don't think there should be pardoning of, of uh, family members. And that would certainly, if you, if you think that the president did something involved with his son, uh, this would be a way to make sure that the, let the son know that if he's going to do something like that, that he's not going to get any benefit on the back end. So I, I think it would help a lot. Let me ask also. Gentlemen's time's expired, right? Oh, that's quick. Yeah. No, it's, it's been expired for a while. 
I'm sorry. Well, thank <laughs> you for right. giving me that extra time. Yes, sir. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields time. He has not. Um, so uh, the, the chair will yield next to the gentlelady from Wyoming, but I'll just point out um, Congressman Bill Posey is Florida's eighth congressional district, seven-term congressman. So um, need to go to more cocktail parties. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Wyoming five minutes. Well, thank you, and thank you for being here, gentlemen. I always love having a discussion about the Constitution. I want to stay right up front, say, state right up front, I am opposed to term limits, and not for any self-serving reason, but because I think they are a bad idea in terms of the future of our republic. I also believe that the intent of the framers must remain a dominant force and should guide, guide the current discussion. The finality of the qualifications clause for congressional members is settled through the text of the Constitution itself. They debated term limits, and some of the framers even supported them in the Articles of Confederation, but after the debate, they were dropped. That doesn't mean that term limits don't exist. They certainly do, which is why the American people go to the ballot every two years for the members of the U.S. House and every six years to select their U.S. Senators. In addition, legislative supremacy is something the founders clearly established through the long list of enumerated and implied powers granted to Congress as compared to the brevity of powers granted to the president in Article II. What does that mean? That the drafters of our Constitution intended the legislative branch, the one directly elected and accountable to the voters, to be the most robust and strongest of the three branches. And I believe that term limits would not only undermine that intent, but substantially alter our relationship with our elected officials. And again, what do I mean by that? For years, I have been railing against the expansion and growth of the administrative state. Those unelected bureaucrats who have taken on the role of legislating in violation of the separation of powers provisions in our Constitution. The annual regulatory burden in this country is $2.1 trillion. That is the cost of the rules and regulations and guidance documents issued by agencies such as the USDA, EPA, Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Forest Service, et cetera, et cetera. Yet of all of these agencies, all of them are totally unaccountable to the American people. I believe we need to strengthen the legislative branch, not weaken it. Yet that is ultimately what will happen if we have term limits. I ran on a platform of empowering the people over the bureaucracy, which means that it is our legislative branch that needs to reclaim its rightful place of making the law. Term limits on Congress will not solve the problem that, you're that you have identified. Now more than ever, our congressional representatives need to stand strong and requiring a routine cycling of elected officials seems to me to be a distraction from where the real issues in Washington, D.C. lie. While I am opposed to any kind of an amendment for term limits, I appreciate my colleague from South Carolina's focus on the need for reform in this broken town. The extent, to that extent, one area where I'm willing to meet my colleague in the middle to advance reform is in imposing term limits on bureaucrats that make up the administrative state those bureaucrats who are nearly impossible to remove and are encouraged to become career officials through benefits such as pensions are in D.C. for generations and have never been approved or voted on by the American people. This is the real danger to our society. These officials make policies with no constituencies and cannot be held accountable if they do something which goes against the needs of the American people, which they routinely do. An example being the radical war on affordable energy being waged by the Biden bureaucracy. I also want to say that as a freshman class of a member, a freshman member of Congress, I think that it is, it is a problem to underestimate the importance of institutional knowledge. How can a member be here for six years and effectively take on a career official who has been here for 35 years? Is Washington DC broken? Absolutely, and the odds are stacked against the American people in a government which has grown too powerful and big to control, and instead it now controls us. But it controls us because of the unelected bureaucrats, not because of your elected officials here in Washington, D.C. Reform is necessary, and it should come from the people who are actually elected by the American people. The only directly elected officials in town should not become the, the target. It should be those who are unaccountable. 
This Congress needs to unify and hold accountable those officials who spend their entire lives in DC without taking a single vote, yet impose trillions of dollars of hidden taxes against us. I want to close by reiterating that term limits already exist through elections, but limiting ballot cho choices doesn't fix problems. It only creates more. And with that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Texas for five minutes. Let me thank the witnesses for their presence here today and for the hearing that we have had. Um, it's important, I think, Mr. Spalding, I'm going to focus on trying to not be redundant, but deliberate um, more with you on this process. First of all, um, I'm glad that the Founding Fathers uh, added uh, Article 5 uh, to at least acknowledge as a democracy uh, we should be prepared in times of absolute need for change or maybe crisis to effectively uh, maneuver a process uh, with two-thirds and three-quarters three that might work on a serious need for change. I heard one member make an important point. Uh, I don't think it is um, a constitutional change, but what the Supreme Court does is it interprets the Constitution and by its interpretation of which I know that I've had extensive disagreement with the Supreme Court of recent years. One could say that they've altered uh, constitutional law or decisions that were premised on constitutional law. And what comes to mind, of course, is the Shelby case that literally destroyed the Voting Rights Act that I think was grounded in the 14th Amendment, equal protection, possibly the 15th Amendment, and then, of course, due process. Um, how they got to their decision of just eliminating voting protections, and of course, we have deteriorated and gone further down. But I think the issue of a constitutional convention uh, is um, uh, clearly um, should be perceived uh, in, from the perspective of the representation of the American people. First, by way of states, and we have the 10th Amendment, what is not left to the federal government is left to the states, uh, and then cities and hamlets and counties that have different jurisdictions as well. So my first question is, um, because of the system that we have, uh, our states, our cities, uh, counties, and hamlets, villages are dependent, are dependent on the federal government. They do major, the government does, major work from interstate um, uh, highways, uh, from the railroads. Uh, now we've gotten into more modern issues of climate change, uh, we see that crime is an issue across America. Uh, cities and states are looking to have a partner in the federal government and how you work to bring down crime. Education has a component of the federal government. So what uh, would, uh, first of all, uh, could you emphasize that dependency and that a balanced budget amendment, though well-intentioned, um, is distinctive from a city that balances budget, which people want to constantly say, my city balances its budget, and how does that in any way uh, argue favorably for uh, the national government to have that obligation? I agree with you, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, wholeheartedly that many states, states, local jurisdictions uh, depend on resources from the federal government to carry out their activities. Um, one important point, we've heard about states having balanced budget requirements. Mm -hmm. um, states generally have an operating budget, which may be balanced. Then they also have a capital budget, which may include borrowing, uh, which may include needing to dip into reserves that weren't raised uh, that year. So um, I think there is uh, some nuance there when we're talking about states uh, abiding by balanced budgets, because in generally, you know, general, there's, there's two. Um, and so I, that's, a, that's a point that I appreciate having the opportunity to make. So we can make the argument that local governments, state governments that balance their budget, there may be uh, some um, unique uh, focus that doesn't equate to a massive budget that the federal government has to do, utilize right. uh, based upon the needs of the American people. Lastly, very quickly, uh, two of my colleagues were eloquent on this whole question of term limits. 
I think it is important to point out that the Founding Fathers rejected it. Give me your, 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 your worst case scenario uh, for the federal government, institutional memory gone, uh, the massiveness of the government, the ability to have elected persons uh, in the people's house be able to reflect what the people want uh, as the government is guided by the executive. How important is the maintenance of the ability to elect who you chose and not have term limits? Uh, it is uh, incredibly important to have that continuity and that institutional memory. And it's also important to acknowledge people are frustrated. Uh, they expect a democracy that is representative and reflective and responsive. Uh, the challenge in my view and in Common Cause's view is not the length of a term um, because there's tremendous wisdom and experience that comes uh, with uh, those who are closest to the people being chosen by the people. The challenge is it's the attacks on the freedom to vote, extreme gerrymandering, the influence of money in politics that has distorted representative democracy. Uh, we've got to fix those challenges. Um, it's not term limits, but to your, to your ultimate you know, point, um, completely agree that term limits can um, uh, increase the power of lobbyists and folks on K Street um, who are here a very long time as people rotate in and off of uh, Capitol Hill. Um, it undermines um, accountability um, because members who aren't facing re-election may take uh, other votes potentially, but ultimately I think it uh, undermines the freedom to vote and ultimately the people to choose who they would like to represent them in the halls of the legislature. General Chairman, Jones. I want to thank you for your indulgence. I just want to make one last sentence on the record. Uh, Ms. Spaulding, you said it. It undermines the people's ability to run their government as they choose. We have to fix it and make it work, but it undermines the people, and I'm standing with the people, from cities to hamlets to villages to states. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me uh, to introduce that statement and to the ranking member as well. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes myself for five minutes. Uh, we've got to answer some of this, Mr. Tom um, So, um, let's do it. You noted uh, that that Gallup says 83% of Americans believe in term limits now. There's good reasons Correct. for that. One of the difficult questions that's been brought up today and that we get often is uh, about the unintended consequences. So, how do you answer the objection that if we impose term limits in Congress, the professional staff who have long careers here will be the ones with all the institutional knowledge and they'll effectively become the unaccountable ruling class. What's the, what's the answer to that? Well, first of all, I do find it uh, very ironic that the point has been made here that um, representatives will be choosing the people over term limits when it's actually 83% of the people who want term limits. So I think the people don't just have a limited right to elect their representatives, they absolutely have a right to decide the parameters around elected office. Um, Senator Mark Warner had a, had a good quote. He called the U.S. federal bureaucracy the largest in the world. Over the last hundred years, the bureaucracy in this nation has gone from 2.5% of GDP to 25% of GDP. According to the Federal Register, we have over 400 different departments, agencies, and sub-agencies, over 100,000 different federal rules and regulations. This is the biggest bureaucracy, and yet, uh, puzzlingly, Congress has never had term limits. So therefore, we are left to conclude that this entire bureaucracy that everyone has a problem with that has become so unaccountable and undemocratic, that was created by career politicians. It wasn't created by term limits. Career politicians created the enabling laws. They uh, sustained it. Uh, they perpetuated it, and they supplied it with uh, a limitless stream of funding. So if the charge is creating bureaucracy, I must say we are putting the wrong defendant on trial. It is career politicians over and over again who blow up bureaucracy, uh, not term limits. But I will tell you, uh, Representative, there is a relationship between term limits and bureaucracy. Term limits reduce bureaucracy. We know this because it happens at the state level. There was a, a paper by Randy Holcomb, Florida State University professor. He found that states with term limits uh, reduce the size of their bureaucracy. There was an analysis done by the National Taxpayers Union which found that the longest serving members of Congress vote to spend the most money hmm. on bureaucracy. And then there was another paper that just came out last year by uh, an NYU professor, uh, Mona Valakfathy, who found that in states with term limits, 
the legislators actually give bureaucrats a more confined mandate and less discretion with respect to what they can do. So the laws are written to bureaucrats, you must implement our law this way, other than you may implement our law this way. And that is a tremendous difference because uh, it means that those legislators, those democratically elected legislators will have their policy wishes carried out uh, into the next generation as opposed to letting unelected bureaucrats uh, decide the rules of the game. Got it. Um, in the amendment process, Mr. Jipping, in the amendment process, can a state legislature alter or amend the language of a proposed constitutional amendment after it has been transmitted to them for ratification? Uh, n not in any substantive way, no. Uh, th there are different states will ratify or, or, or not ratify, but they'll make their ratification decision uh, in somewhat different ways. But when a constitutional amendment is proposed, the states consider ratifying that constitutional that, that amendment. That specific language, so there's not a danger that it goes That's off right. the rails at that point. Can Congress set a time limit for states to ratify a proposed amendment? Absolutely they can, and they've done it many, many times. Uh, as I said, the, the validity or, the, or whether a time limit is uh, valid and binding, that depends on Congress's authority, not whether Congress puts it here or here on the page right. of a joint resolution. They've done both. States have ratified both. And uh, certainly Congress throughout history, uh, from you know Representative Martha Griffiths in 1972, would not have put that uh, ratification deadline in the joint resolutions proposing clause, saying that doing so would increase support for the amendment if it wasn't valid. As the ERA. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, so we know that that one lapsed, by the way, because we have that debate here all the time. It's clearly the ERA's time limit is lapsed. Right. It, it died more than 40 years ago. Everyone knew that it died. Everyone knew that the deadline was valid. Uh, 1986, Gloria Steinem was on Oprah Winfrey, and an audience member asked her what was the status of the ERA. She said, it ran out of time. It has to start over and go through the process again. I don't find myself in agreement with Gloria Steinem about many things, but she was right. <laughs> All right, unfortunately, I'm out of time. Um, so I will now recognize the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Scanlon, for five minutes. Thank you. So as we've explored these issues around amending or revising the Constitution pursuant to either process authorized by Article 5, we've had some interesting conversations which expose just how complicated uh, issues of constitutional change can be and why we should proceed with caution, I think. I've been heartened to find areas of agreement with some of our colleagues across the aisle, including on issues of term limits and balanced budget amendments. And I was interested in your observation, Mr. Spaulding, that the influx of dark money in politics is probably more corrosive to our democracy than the absence of term limits. I would agree with that. So here we are, we've just returned from the House floor where yet again an attempt to fund the government, a core constitutional duty for Congress, has been thwarted by an extremist anti-government minority, not even a majority, a minority. So I'm listening with trepidation to these suggestions that we should impose additional burdens, uh, whether a, a balanced budget amendment or some kind of supermajority requirement on our budgetary process when we can't even seem to get it done right now with what we have. I understand many people are frustrated by the difficulty and pace of confirming constitutional amendments. Mr. Cohen mentioned his amendment, which would limit the ability of a president to pardon him or herself. I've been waiting my entire adult life for final acknowledgement, enrollment, or resurrection of the Equal Rights Amendment, depending on what side of that debate you want to come down on. In the past month, I've had constituents advocate for amendments, many of which have been adopted by various states, including amendments to guarantee access to reproductive health care, including abortion care, to overturn the Citizens United decision, which has allowed a flood of dark money in our politics, to guarantee the right of labor to organize and collectively bargain, to protect and improve a healthy environment for current and future generations, a right to a thorough and efficient public education and the possibility of revising or repealing the Second Amendment 
So these are all ideas that have merit and deserve congressional consideration. Uh, recently, former Senator Russ Feingold and constitutional scholar Peter Prindeville published an interesting analysis of the purpose and history of Article 5. It's entitled The Constitution in Jeopardy, probably too long to enter in the record. Um, but it examines many of these open questions and the pitfalls in the current ar Article 5 and suggests that maybe we should consider streamlining or somehow managing this process so that we could have a more fluid constitutional um, amendment process without um, denigrating the, the really um, touchstone that the Constitution is supposed to be, keeping it above the fray of ordinary politics and factionalism. Uh, Mr. Spaulding, do you have anything to comment on that idea? Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Scanlon. It's a terrific book, um, and I highly recommend it as well. Um, and I think it grapples with um, all of the unanswered questions that we've been talking about today, all of the risks that a constitutional convention would put our civil rights and civil liberties up for grab. I mean, we're living at a time right now where there's a fever among some states to ban books and directly attack the First Amendment. So would that be, would that be you know, issue A at a constitutional convention? One of the proposals um, that uh, Senator Feingold and Mr. Printable uh, have in that book is to have, um, in this very room, have Congress explore an amendment to Article 5 that would answer some of these questions, but would proceed through the stable, transparent route that we've followed 27 times before, that would allow open debate, that would allow us to explore answers to those questions. And I think it's a provocative and interesting proposal that does merit review. Um, but it, what's, what's most important is, it both preserves and empowers people, but it also uh, recognizes the important stability that is provided by congressional review. Okay, thank you. Um, I would seek unanimous consent to include the following items in the record. Uh, first is an article written by former Senator Russ Feingold, now president of the American Constitution Society, titled Warning, a Convention of States is Practicing to Rewrite the Constitution, published in The Nation, July 14, 2023. Without objection. A September 2022 New York Times article entitled A Second Constitutional Convention, Some Republicans Want to Force One. Without objection. An extensive piece by Professor David Super of Georgetown University Law Center uh, dated October 2021 uh, titled A Dangerous Adventure, No Safeguards Would Protect Basic Liberties from an Article 5 Convention. Without objection. An article from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Five Reasons to Reject Any Constitutional Balanced Budget Amendment. Without objection. An article from the Center for American Progress entitled Tax Cuts Are Primarily Responsible for the Increasing Debt Ratio. Without objection. Two more. An article from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities entitled Constitutional Balance Budget Amendment Poses Serious Risks. Without objection. And a Washington Post article dated September 16, 2023 entitled What Term Limits for Congress Would Actually Do to Senate and House. Without objection. Thank you, and seeing my time is required, expired, I would yield back. The gentlelady yields back, and this will conclude today's hearing, and we want to sincerely thank our witnesses again for appearing today and for your flexibility and your patience. It means a lot to us. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record, and given that big load there, I'll probably have to do that to uh, balance the record. Uh, without objection, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.